How many of you have me for class? All okay, right, now we're good. talking. I like it, I like it. Okay. Welcome everybody. Dr. Doris? Okay, thank you. Okay, once again, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to the Freshman Program's Common Reading Experience kickoff event. I'm Doris Jones, the director of the program. I want to first take a moment to acknowledge our dean, Dr. Rere Lachimi, of Undergraduate Studies and for the Academy of Liberal Arts. She has a prior engagement, so unfortunately she could not join us today. However, our associate dean, Dr. Matthew Hendersot, is here. Let's please give him an acknowledgement. Education. In a few moments, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Dr. Thomas Walsey, who will provide a more formal introduction for our guest speaker. But first, I would like to say a few words about the common reading experience. We're now entering our seventh year, and the common reading experience is going to continue with our use of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 as part of AUC's centennial celebrations. As you all know, we're celebrating 100 years here at the American University in Cairo. As you may know, Bradbury is well known for having authored a variety of dystopian novels, and Fahrenheit 451 remains an acclaimed 20th century novel set in a bleak and dystopian future. Bradbury won the National Book Foundation Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters, and Fahrenheit 451, which is now more than 60 years old, continues to receive many literary accolades. Beyond the bounty of socio-political queries the book provokes, Fahrenheit 451 also begs questions such as, why do some books remain popular throughout the ages while others do not? What factors determine whether a book becomes a critical success? And what exactly do we mean by critical success? The way we view and answer these questions should allow us to look at how our literary cultures are shaped, our commitment to literacy, our commitment to education, and perhaps what we might hope will be our shared cultural passion for reading. I often think about other authors who are equally as important as Ray Bradbury, and some of them include, for example, Carl Sagan's The Pale Blue Dot, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, Henry James' Washington Square, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, and many, many more, which are among some of my favorite reads. The freshman program's Come and Reading experience seeks to therefore galvanize your passion for reading also. I believe books will remain a central place in which we can cultivate questions about complex situations and spark our imagination, even as we live in this hyper-digitized world with 24-hour global entertainment, which often appears to be dominant. So at this time, I would like to invite my colleague, Dr. Thomas Wolsey, from the Graduate School of Education, who will now introduce our special guest. Let's please welcome Dr. Wolsey. Hello, should we dance? Hi, everybody. So glad you were able to join us this afternoon. Um, I wanted to tell you something. You know, uh, Dr. Doris pointed out to you that uh, Radbury is actually well known for a variety of books. He was often characterized as a science fiction author, but he wrote all kinds of things. In fact, I think only two, I think Danny and I were discussing, only two of his books are actually science fiction, Martian Chronicles and, of course, Fahrenheit 451. This is his mystery novel. I got to meet the man, so I'm really pleased to show you. This is his signature um, before he died. He didn't sign many books after he died. So in any case, I want to just point out to you, there, there are a lot of people that have helped make this event possible. Uh, our dean, Dr. D, uh, uh, Dr. Heba el at the Graduate School of Education, you have some materials. I hope that you will, yes, please. Uh, you 
have some materials about the Graduate School of Education, our professional education development programs, our, grad, our master's program. Especially of interest to you might be our minor and our core classes. They have titles like Superheroes Don't Wear Capes, They Carry Laptops. And we have uh, Seeing the Elephant and Movies in Education. So there are a lot of different opportunities to come and join us at GSE. We have Mr. Walid and Ms. Dina who make everything at GSE happen. And Mr. Nestor over here is Mr. Brussel, Dr. Brussel's uh, business colleague who makes everything happen behind the scenes for Dr. Danny. Dr. Danny Brussel and I have been friends for quite a while, but I brought him here not just because he's a good friend, but because he knows how to make reading interesting. He knows how to tell you the secrets that make you want to dig in. Let's read Fahrenheit 451. Dr. Brussel, all yours. Thank you, everybody. Can we all give a big hand to Dr. Thomas for all of his work? And again, I'm here because of the Graduate School of Education, so make sure to thank the Graduate School of Education. And most importantly, thank yourselves for showing up today. Give yourself a Okay, so we're going to call this uh, the Common Reading Experience or Fire for Reading. Fahrenheit 451, the Common Reading Experience. I always like to get to know who everybody is in the room. So right now, everybody turn to an attractive person beside you. If you see a person look at you and look away, you ain't looking so hot this afternoon. <laughs> and say hi to a couple of people. I'll give you seven seconds to do that. Go. are going to play a game. This game requires that you get a partner. I will give you five seconds to determine who your partner is. Go. <laughs> and I will give you four seconds to determine who is partner A and who is partner B. Go. Partner A, stand up. For the next 11 seconds, tell partner B what makes you so awesome. Go! Southern California. Now raise your hand if you remember how you learned to read. Oh, 
calm and joy got nuts. She hated me. Now, I was the best artist in our third grade classroom. And one day, Mrs. Allman asked us to draw a picture of a clown. I don't remember exactly what my clown picture looked like. I think it looked something like this. It was pretty awesome. And as Mrs. Allman looked over my shoulder and said, that's not very good now, is it, Danny? And that was the last day I drew a picture. And that one statement got me to lose my passion for drawing. Mrs. Newman was the woman that successfully get me to hate science. She was my ninth grade science teacher, and the woman never changed the tone of her voice. Hello, class, and welcome to the exciting world of life science. The school is burning down as I speak. I have a large laceration above my left eyebrow. I'm slowly bleeding to death. I was asleep within 10 minutes every single day in her classroom, but it can work the other way as well. I was always blessed with great English teachers. Mrs. Witt was my eighth grade English teacher. Mrs. Witt was 183 years old. She was about four feet tall. Her teeth reminded you of summer. Summer here, summer there. She was old school. She believed the English language should be memorized and diagrammed mathematically. You know, her grading policy on every single paper, one spelling mistake, automatic C. Two spelling mistakes, automatic F. One grammatical mistake, automatic C. Two grammatical mistakes, automatic F. This is before she graded the paper. And failure was not an option with her. She'd keep you in attention until midnight, until you got it right. I mean, the football coach was horrified by this woman. Every year, she gave her top student her coveted penny. It was a penny, man. And we all wanted it. <laughs> Out of 325 eighth graders, I took second. I had a 98.7%. Sarah Davidson had a 99.2%. She was a nerd. And Mrs. Whip looked at me and said, never settle for second best, Purcell. Dang, that woman was tough. But thank goodness I had Mrs. Whip. I could have never passed Ms. McClain's class had I not had Mrs. Whip. Ms. McClain was my 11th grade teacher. In her 25 years of teaching, she had never had a student score higher than a 95% on her final exam. Now, I had a solid B in her classroom, and one day my buddy and I were calculating our grades, and I determined in order to move from a B to an A, I had to score a 97% on her final exam. I also calculated that I could get a zero and maintain my B. And being a student that always liked to challenge himself, I turned to my buddy and said, oh, guess I got to be. She overheard that. She leaned in. She's like, this is the moment, Daniel. This is the moment that's going to determine the course of your entire future. She guilted me in to studying for this exam for the next three weeks, and I scored a 96%. The highest grade ever in her class. And she gave me a B. <laughs> the woman never let me get away with anything. I do a paper quickly. She wouldn't even look at it. She'd say, how dare you, Daniel? How dare you put her name on this? <laughs> she was a huge New York Yankees fan, and she liked to remind me in his final season as a New York Yankee, Joe DiMaggio was playing in a meaningless game. The Yankees had already punched the pennant. They were up a run. DiMaggio hits a single, tries to stretch it into a double slice, head first to the second base, almost kills him. A rookie at the end of the inning is like, Joe, what were you thinking? DiMaggio looked at the rookie and said, I was thinking some kid, this might be his first time in Yankee Stadium. I want him to know what kind of player I am. Ms. McClain looked at me and said, Daniel, someday you're going to meet your maker. And it ain't going to be a very good day. So you need to make your worst day your best day by never giving anything less than your best effort. It's actually one of the best lessons anybody's ever taught me. Now, I did my undergraduate degree at American University in Washington, D.C. I was a political science major, but I took Steve Taylor's journalism class because uh, the basketball team took that class, so I knew it was an easy class. Uh, and uh, Steve kept me after class one night and said, you know, I really wish you'd switch majors, Danny. You're the best writer I've ever read. Well, that statement got me to change majors. And Steve, Steve was the person to get me my first job as a journalist, so it can work the other way as well. The second idea I want us to remember, passion is powerful. Passion. Nothing is so contagious as enthusiasm. If you're enthusiastic about the things you're working on, 
People will come to ask you to do interesting things. Remember the Chinese proverb, a person without a smiling face must not open a shop. You want people to be happy around you, you got to be happy around them. You want to be happier, read happy books. Don't read depressing books. If you look at Fahrenheit 451, one of the great things about Guy Montag is it's books that open up his mind to brand new ideas. He was just living like everybody else in society. It's one of my favorite things about Fahrenheit 451 was he wanted to learn more about the world, and books are your passport to the entire world. That leads to the third idea I want you to remember about inspiration is we become who we hang out with. Translation. Avoid people like this <laughs> and this. Keep away from the negative energy. <laughs> there are people out there who just want to knock you down. And I have found that miserable people are not satisfied with being miserable. They want you to be miserable as well. Further translation. You want to be a reader? Hang out with readers. You want to be a jerk? Hang out with jerks. You become exactly who you hang out with. So everybody repeat after me. I love to read. I love to read. Give yourselves a hand. I've always thought that the best leaders are reflective leaders. So I'm going to give you uh, 18 seconds right now with the people around you. I want, to t I want you to tweet or tell which of these three inspirational reading strategies you're going to take and, and start implementing immediately. Your 18 seconds begins now. <laughs>
I want you to draw a circle above the O and the G and draw a dot inside that circle. Draw a circle above the O and the G and draw a dot inside that circle. Step two, I want you to draw a semi-oval above the D. I want you to connect the D with the O with one line. And I want you to draw a dot inside the O. Draw a semicircle above the D, draw a line between the D and the O, and draw a dot inside the O. Step three, I want you to draw a vertical line from the bottom of the D and a diagonal line from the bottom of the G. Diagonal line from the bottom of the D. <laughs> Step four, I want you to draw an oval at the bottom. Finally, step five, I want you to shade in the G, add a dot, leave a dot for a nose, you can add a smile there, and show the people next to you the dog you just drew. Oh. And if it's not perfect, don't worry, it's the first time you ever did it, you'll be better next time. So here's my question, how many of you are artists? Raise your hands. Everybody's an artist. It's one of my favorite ways to get kids excited about reading and writing is word tunes. He shows you how to take high frequency words and turn them into cartoons. That leads to idea number two. Reading should always be self-selected. Any of you ever read a book by Will Hobbs? He's one of the best-selling young adult authors in the world. He writes books that are especially popular with teenage boys. Before he became a best-selling author, he was my seventh grade reading teacher in Durango, Colorado. And Will was the first person to get me excited about reading. He had 5,000 books in his classroom, and every day at the beginning of class, he would tell us what he was reading, we would tell him what we were reading, and the rest of the class, we read. Whenever we finish a book, we'd go up to Mr. Hobbs, he'd put down the book he was reading, look through our book, ask us three or four questions, and if he was satisfied with our answers, he gave us a point. Every book up to 200 pages is worth one point. Every extra 100 pages is worth another point. You needed 25 points to get an A, and the top five point totals had their names written on the board. And I wanted my name written on that board. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. 500 page book, four point book. Also an excellent Disney film starring James Mason and Kirk Douglas. I didn't really feel like reading the book. So I uh, went up to Mr. Hobbs, he asked me four questions and I learned a very valuable lesson that day. Books ain't always like the movies. And guess what Mr. Hobbs did? He gave me the four points. And that was a great teaching strategy because I learned guilt works because I read every word of every page of every book from that point forward. Wound up with 44 points, went well above and beyond what I had to do. He used the single greatest strategy I've ever seen a teacher use to get a person excited about reading. May I share it with you? Yes. yes. He found out what I was excited about, which was football. Yes. And at least once a week, he'd give me a book on football. He'd say, hey, check this out, Danny. I know you'll like it. What are the odds I open up that book? In my experience with all ages, 100%. The kid might not read it, but they're going to open it. Also in my experience, by the fourth time I do that with a kid, they're going to try and read that book. Because there's nothing more powerful than somebody significant in your life, a professor, a coach, a parent, a pastor, a, a good friend, saying, you know what? I was thinking of you when I was reading this. The third idea is distractions equal detractions. One of the things I love about Fahrenheit 451, if any of you have read the book already, is Guy Montag's uh, wife, Mildred. She's addicted to TV, and it reminded me a lot of the book Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl. There's a character named Mike TV, and he has to play video games, and he has to watch TV all the time. And that's what's causing a lot of people not to read nowadays. We don't live in the 18th century, where there's nothing to do. 
There's lots to do every single day. We have distractions constantly, and so it's really important that we engage ourselves in reading. So again, the best leaders, the most successful readers are reflective readers. So I'm going to give you 18 seconds with the people around you. Reflect on which of these three ideas you can start doing immediately. Your 18 seconds begins now. I'd trick 
my thumb and paint in my blood. Dang! That dude liked to paint. And he wasn't going to let anybody or anything stand between him and his passion. Don't let anybody ever tell you what you cannot do. You are a human being until you are six feet under. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. You are an incredible time in Egypt's history. Anything is possible. And all of us see the world in totally different ways. Always remember that. Whisper to your neighbor what you think the picture looks like. I'll give you nine seconds. Go.